Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are new here or you've been sitting in the back row and you enjoy what you are listening to, please don't hesitate to hit that subscribe button and then set your notification bell to all that way you know every time I upload. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tug and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True 911 and Police Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. Or read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. I still have nightmares from this call. Maybe it shouldn't have impacted me this badly, but it did. I received a call from a man who said his son had committed suicide. He and his wife had heard the shot go off in his room and then saw blood come out from under the door. My instructions on any call where the person is injured but could possibly be assisted, i.e. not known for a fact to be deceased, was to ask the caller to check for breathing. The man told me, Ma'am, I don't want to go in there. I heard the shot. I see his blood. I'm sure he's dead. I asked him again to check in hopes that we could provide first aid or CPR and possibly keep the son going until an ambulance could get there. The father reluctantly did as I asked and entered his son's room. Then I heard him vomit and start sobbing violently. The boy was dead. I won't be graphic, but the shot had administered in such a way that the best surgeon in the world could not have corrected the damage. The father had been right and I had forced him in there and made it to where the last sight of his son was horrific and traumatic. If I had left it alone, he wouldn't have seen his son in that condition. I have children, and I can't imagine having to see them that way. After I hung up, I cried. All the way home, I cried. Almost three years later, typing this, I feel like crying. I know I did what I was supposed to be doing per the instructions in place of my dispatch center, but this situation still haunts me to this day. This story happened to me about a month ago, and it's been haunting me for the past month. I've thought about it every free moment of every day, and it's tormenting me. I think just telling people the story may help me feel a little bit better about it, so I figured I would share it with you. I'm an EMT, and about a month ago, we got a call for a really bad car accident with two passengers. I found out after the fact that a teenage guy still in high school and his girlfriend were going 90 plus miles per hour in a Mustang and a cop saw them and wanted to pull them over but instead they took off. The guy took a turn way too fast and slid into a pole. We got to the scene and found the car had slid into the pole and wrapped around the pole and almost looked like a game of horseshoes. The passenger side hit the pole and his girlfriend was very clearly dead, likely on impact. Her head was flattened on one side, her eyes hanging out, brains oozing out of her nose, and most major bones clearly broken. The teenage guy was semi-conscious. He was looking around in shock trying to figure out what had just happened. He had blood coming out from his ears and nose, his right cheekbone caved in, we managed to get him out of the car with a surprising ease as the driver's side of the car wasn't damaged bad enough to jam the door shut. We cut off his clothes, put him on a stretcher with a collar on, and immediately put him in the ambulance and floored it the whole way to the hospital. I could see every single time he took a breath, his broken ribs would pop in and out while I listened to his lungs 
fell with blood. I could see major bruising taking place on his torso, and he was starting to fade. I just became an EMT a few months before this, so I was new and didn't really know what to do. All of a sudden, he stopped breathing and we hooked him onto a ventilator. I was frantic. This was one of my very first major calls and I'd never seen anything like this. My more experienced partner, a paramedic as well, remained calm and tried to assure me everything would be okay. And just as I was starting to calm down a bit more, the patient went into cardiac arrest. I began performing CPR and could feel his ribs were broken as I performed CPR while my partner hooked the patient onto life support. Shortly after, we arrived at the hospital and my partner and I rushed out of the ambulance to get the patient into the hospital. A trauma team was already waiting for us. My partner told them everything that happened as the guy's mom arrived. She was frantic and I had to try to keep her away from her son and she asked me what had happened. I explained to her what happened and that he was on life support and a ventilator and the hysterical mom asked me, life support? And I said, yes, he's, he's still alive, but he's on life support. We are getting him into surgery as we speak. At this point, my partner comes back over to me after relaying all the information to the trauma team, and the mom asked me, So, do you mean to tell me if you took him off of life support, he would be dead? And my partner solemnly replied back with, No, what I mean to tell you is that he is dead, and we're trying to bring him back. We excused ourselves as we had more calls to attend to. We later found out from the surgeon on hand that about 15 minutes after arrival, the patient succumbed to his injuries. It's still so haunting to me, hearing his lungs fill with blood and seeing his broken ribs move with his breathing, seeing him look around in shock as he coughed up blood from his nose and mouth. I can't handle coins anymore because the metal smell reminds me of the smell of blood. I can't see things with ketchup, syrup, or similar things because it reminds me too much of all the blood. I can't unsee any of this stuff, and it still haunts me. I have nightmares every single night about it, but I don't think I can last at this job for very much longer. When I was still working full time for the fire department, I often took shifts working the medical part of the 911 center. Back in 2006, when flip phones were still the most common, pinning down a location was not very easy. We were still using primitive cell phone location technology, which didn't help as it only gave us a general area of miles instead of feet. A young girl called in using her mother's flip phone and told me that her mom had fallen down the stairs and wouldn't wake up. After several questions, I figured out that the mother wasn't breathing and this was the scariest part of the call because the girl couldn't give us an address and when someone stops breathing, the seconds count. As much as I tried, I couldn't get the little girl to tell me her address. All she could tell me was she lived on a farm, which wasn't helpful at all because a huge portion of my district is rural farmlands. While talking to the young girl, I asked her how long ago her mother fell down the stairs, and she told me that she fell down just after a TV show she was watching started. I looked at the clock, and it was just the top of the hour, so piecing it together, I surmised that... She had been down maybe 30 minutes. I asked the young girl to focus and try and tell me where she lives. I asked her if she knew the street name, and she said she didn't. I asked her if she could tell me any landmarks, and that's when she told me the church she goes to is down the street. 
By this time, my supervisor and the police chief are looking at a map and they located 12 churches within the rural areas. Since she couldn't tell us which church, we decided to dispatch all of our units, giving each of them a specific target. Once they got to the target, we instructed each unit to turn on their lights and sirens and drive around the area. With only one fire station with two ambulances and several fire rescue vehicles and four police officers to cover a huge area, we dispatched them to cover around the churches as the farmsteads were sometimes miles apart from each other. Hearing our calls over the radio, several sheriff deputies and highway patrol troopers decided to join in and help. We are now almost 15 minutes into the call. We told the young girl to take the phone and go outside and listen for the police cars and the fire trucks. It seemed like forever, but she eventually heard the sirens from one of the vehicles, but couldn't see it. We told each responder to stop and turn off their sirens, and then one by one, we had them turn them back on so we could tell which one was the closest to her. It turned out to be the one of the fire rigs, so we sent everybody to their position, and they then spread out to cover the area in general, all with their sirens on again. Eventually, one of the state troopers pulled onto her street and the girl could see him coming. We pinned down the location as he got closer and the sirens got louder until she told us he was in front of her house. By the time the trooper got inside the house, the mother was breathing and trying to get her bearings and get up. We got medical on scene and she was transported to the hospital with a broken back. The young girl was given a little reward from the police department for her bravery and the call as she kept calm and did everything we told her to do. The mother made a full recovery with no brain damage. Doctors don't know if she did indeed stop breathing, but only for a short time, or if the little girl didn't understand the question, and though sleeping meant not breathing or something. This call is a reminder why we don't stress enough to teach your kids your first and last names, their phone number, and a phone number of their parents, and most importantly, their home address. And if there is a landline phone in the house, to use that to call 911 over using a cell phone, as the landline phone will give us an exact address because cell phones can only sometimes give us the exact location, or at least the location of within 700 yards. So please teach your children this important information. The next time it could be you hanging on to those precious seconds. I was an EMT for a while. We got a call about someone who was riding their bike at a breakneck speed when they hit a car head first without a helmet. We went over immediately. Despite the fact that it was broad daylight and we were in the middle of suburbia on a Saturday, nobody else came to check on this poor guy. Seriously, the streets were empty. Usually, a massive crowd gathers around violent accidents like this. So his skull was pretty much smashed in, and he was unresponsive. It was the worst head injury I had ever seen. We assessed that he had a major skull fracture, a concussion, and he was bleeding profusely. He was also missing teeth and had a minor road rash. But fortunately, he wasn't missing much skin. To give you an idea of how bad it really was, this was the kind of injury that most people do not survive. If you did survive, you'd basically be a crippled vegetable. Normally, we would have moved him off the road, but when someone has a head or neck injury, that isn't very safe. My partner, who was also training me as I was still kind of new, went to check his pulse while I began to unload our gear. He crouched down, felt for a pulse for a while, and then stood up and opened his mouth to say something. Suddenly, the guy 
fucking jumped up. He didn't use his arms to pick himself up. He just fucking jumped to his feet. It startled the shit out of both of us. He looked at us, smiled, and attempted to grab his bike. We tried to stop him, but we didn't exactly want to wrestle him to the ground given his condition. He gets away from us and bolts into the woods without his bike. My partner was in even more disbelief than I was. He just stared at where the man had run off, mouth agape. Then he turned to me and muttered, He had no fucking pulse, man. I asked him if he was sure, and he swore up and down that the biker was clinically dead. We contacted the authorities for assistance, and they sent a search and rescue team into the forest. I don't know if he was found or not, because we normally don't get much information about patients after they go to the professionals. Keep in mind that this was the Pine Barrens, so they had a lot of ground to cover. My best guess is that he went to a loved one's house out of confusion. What I found out about that is, head injuries bleed like fucking hell, so you'd think the guy would leave a long red trail of blood for the cops to follow, but they never found any. Oh, oops, my mistake. It seems I left out some details. I am not an EMT anymore. I was only an EMT for about a year. I decided the medical field wasn't for me, and I switched to pursue computer science. Don't get EMT and paramedics mixed up. We are only taught the basics of first aid, and then we just take a test. It's basically the lowest level job you could get in the medical field. So, we can't legally pronounce someone dead. In fact, we almost always leave fatal accidents to the more qualified people. Had this person actually had been dead, we wouldn't have done much. I didn't mean this was a fatal accident. The shock wasn't that he just sprung back to life, but rather that he was alive despite lacking a pulse. Keep in mind, the guy was riding his bike very quickly through a suburban area when he struck a parked car. The car was a hatchback, parallel parked on the street. The house the car was parked outside of was, presumably, who called us in. But for whatever reason, people seem to think that you can just call us and be done with it. It was a bit out of the ordinary that somebody seemed to notice that an accident happened though. And I have no idea what happened to this guy. Head injuries usually cause people to become violent and uncooperative. But you've got to be very careful with them because moving their head and neck around too much can cause damage to the spine. When he got up, it really took us by surprise. And it didn't help that he moved pretty damn quickly. As he attempted to grab his bike, my partner attempted to grab his arm. He pretty much quickly slipped away and ran. We immediately contacted authorities and told them. They arrived, we told them what we knew, and then they sent a small team to find him. I imagine they did find him because he clearly was never reported missing. If he had, I imagine the news would have jumped on it. The first responders are never really given information about a patient after they do their job, so I can't say for sure what happened to him after he ran. One of the scariest type of emergency calls is infant child has stopped breathing and is turning blue. I was dispatched on a couple of these calls when I was in training and learning from the experienced EMTCs and paramedics. On one call, dispatch informs us that the infant is two months old and has been sick with a cold and sinus congestion for the past few days. Also, that the infant had stopped breathing. The attendant in charge was a recent med school grad and paramedic 
who was completing her residency at MCV, or Medical College of Virginia, and was also continuing to volunteer at the rescue squad on a regular basis. On the way to the call, the paramedic quickly diagnosed the problem as snot in the nose blocking the airway. As babies are nose breathers, when the nose is stopped up, they cannot get any air. Accordingly, we arrived on scene within one to two minutes, suctioned the nose and the baby began breathing again, and recovered her nice pink color. All was good. On another call, I was being trained by a college kid, his name was Scott, who would go on to medical school a few years later. This time, the baby, who had stopped breathing and was turning blue, had been sick with a fever for the past few days. Fire and rescue arrived quickly on scene before we did and had started CPR. On the way to the call, Scott instructed the ambulance driver to set the air conditioning as cold as possible and turn the fan blowers on full. He told me to wet down some towels and chill them with the ice cold air coming from the vent. We arrived on scene and a fireman met us at the door of the ambulance with a limp and blue baby. Scott took the child, set him on the gurney, and covered him with the wet, cold towels. Within 30 seconds, the baby began to breathe again. He had experienced a febrile seizure due to his high fever. Again, a little bit of knowledge and some very capable hands had saved the day. These weren't significantly scary calls as I wasn't the person in charge and the person in charge knew what to do. However, without the pertinent knowledge and experienced crew, they would have been terrifying. It was a week before my daughter's 13th birthday. I was sitting in my pod, joking with my pod mate, as I was making goodie bags for her party. It was a spa day slash slumber party. I remember one of my pod mates saying we should open the face masks and put them on to pamper ourselves. When my phone rang, it was almost 10 p.m., an hour and 45 minutes to go. The voice on the line was young, a female. She whispered, I can't do this anymore. Please help me. I could hear banging on the other line and a male screaming for her to open the door. I immediately started sending out help. Thankfully, it was a residential line because I couldn't get much out of her. I thought it was just a domestic, an everyday domestic, but it was much worse. She was only 14, not much older than my baby was turning. She had a gun to her head. It was her father on the other side begging her to open the door. He wasn't trying to break it down. I started pleading for her to put the gun down. She kept telling me that she wanted out, wouldn't and couldn't do things anymore. I couldn't tell you truly how hard I begged her. In that moment, she was my baby on that line. I would have given up 10 years of my own life to save her, but her choice was made. I will never forget the bang or the screaming on the line as her father finally broke the door in. I will forever remember him screaming how sorry he was. That thrill, empty, hollow shrieking. Pick up the phone, sir. Pick it up. I need to talk you through CPR. Sir, pick it up. Deputies are coming. Paramedics are coming. Please pick up the phone. Nothing. Just shrieks now. I stayed on the open line calling out to someone to pick up, but the phone was tossed aside. As the paramedics and deputies finally arrived on scene and called it. Signal 7. That was now her name. Death Investigation. As I disconnected, I remembered looking down at my girl's party supplies and thinking about how that girl would never have another birthday. A silly, stupid thought, but it was what went through my mind. 
I didn't cry until I drove home. A full hour drive, non-stop. It was gulping sobs. Pulling into the drive, I wiped my face, went into my kids' rooms, and held my children close. Years have gone by. It wasn't the last on the line suicide I've dealt with. They don't get any easier. You just learn to push on. Just keep on answering the next call. I've delivered babies, given hanging instructions, talked to toddlers, having nightmares, too afraid to wake up mommy. Listen to people take their last breaths and dealt with people calling because their taco order was incorrect. I've been threatened, screamed at, called filthy names, but I don't stop. I've lost loved co-workers to suicide. The stress is high. There is very little closure. We carry a heavy burden long after the call has ended. Crime scene cleaners are what they call us. Technically, we are biohazard remediation and forensic cleaners. We clean up blood, bodily fluids, and infectious materials you don't want staying around. We even clean hoarders' homes. Yes, we do that too. I've been in this business for 32 long years, and boy, have I seen it all, and then some. A few years back, we cleaned out an elderly lady's home with about 15 cats. It was horrendous, and talk about the smell. These cats weren't even using the litter box anymore because they were so full of waste. So you can only imagine having to rip up carpet and toss out furniture. It was a mess. It took many long, grueling hours. Over the many years I have worked in this field, nothing surprises me anymore. I've cleaned up scenes where a body was cut in half, a man that died with HIV. I had to be really careful with that one. Horrible accidents and things you just don't care to remember. We always wear our PPE, gloves, biohazard suits, face masks, respirators, and gloves. We have to be cautious because blood-borne pathogens are no joke. The worst mess I had to clean up was a man who had murdered his wife, two toddler children, and then turned the gun on himself. Rumor was he was having financial difficulty and about to lose a really top-paying job. He was used to providing the good life for his family and was very ashamed. A week before he committed this gruesome act, he was actually diagnosed with severe depression, but refused to seek any help for it. I went into the children's bedroom and saw little bloody handprints on the wall. I went home and couldn't sleep that night. I didn't dare tell my wife. It was a really sad story. Sometimes the less you know about a case, the better. We have to separate our feelings when doing a job because we have to focus on doing it right. It takes a whole lot of work and dedication and not a job to be rushed. You don't want a family to come back home thinking it's a clean house and find a single bone fragment, speck of blood or vomit. You better check the walls for bone fragments too. If that happens, grab the pliers. Putty knives are our best friend. They do a great job scraping up brain matter from the floor and walls. When brain matter dries, you are not getting it up very easily. It turns into like a cement consistency. If that doesn't do the trick, we can use a truck-mounted steam injection machine, which melts the stubborn brain matter and gets it all up. We use shovels for large amounts of blood. It coagulates in about two hours into a jelly-like substance and shovels surely do the trick. Our foggers get rid of the odor. The bacteria in the odor is harmful for anyone to be breathing. Death has a very pungent smell. 
it can cause respiratory problems. We sometimes get unattended deaths, which means when the person died, no one was living with them. So you can only imagine what smells were coming from that particular scene. Bacteria feeds on the remains, breaking down the organs and gases start to expel from the corpse. You have to be very flexible for this job. You can be called out day or night at any moment's notice. You can be eating Christmas dinner and have to be called out. I don't care if you're eating a nice big damn ham. You have to stop eating and be there for that grieving family. It is your duty. It is not a job for the faint of heart. A decomposing body on the top floor apartment complex is not the prettiest. It's a lot of hard work when you realize it's dripping to the next floor below. You will be spending hours ripping up floorboards, carpet, and pretty much doing a full demolition on the place. The emotional toll of this job is tough. I've seen people come and go who couldn't handle it. The turnover rate can be pretty high. We have to have tough skin and be able to joke a little. You have to have stamina and a strong stomach. I've seen a former employee throw up in his respiratory mask. This guy was a big, burly guy with large skull tattoos on his forearms. He took the job because he claimed he could handle anything and loved horror movies. He had the wrong idea going in and quit the very next day. I guess he really didn't know what he got himself into. Do I ever regret getting into this field? I'd have to say no. I have my good days and bad days like any other job. I enjoy spending time with my coworkers. They are my family. We can lean on each other for emotional support when needed. I've enjoyed watching our equipment change over the years from maps to actual machines that can do it for you. Trust me, it saves a lot of time. Now that I've shared my story with you, I'm going to go to bed. Hopefully get a full night's rest because tomorrow I will be sitting in my office waiting for that next call. Johnson Bio Recovery Service. This is Rick speaking. I work graveyard shifts at an unarmed security guard. That's Officer Renikop to you, smartass. Just kidding. That's what I call it, too. I've had the same post since starting with the company now going on a year. It's in a fairly busy metropolitan area, but it's really quiet at night. There's a police station practically across the street, so I'm mostly just there to satisfy the insurance company or on the off chance someone's brazen enough to try and steal building materials. The main area of the project is an office building. There's a multi-level parking structure that's attached, also mid-construction. The rear of the property is bordered by a tall concrete wall, after which there's a busy highway running in parallel. One night, maybe a week or two after Thanksgiving, I was sitting in my car, deep into an especially long and depraved session of Plague Incorporated during which I repeatedly killed off all the Earth's inhabitants through very torturous and sadistic means. A thin layer of snow had already accumulated on my windshield since my last patrol. I couldn't really see out of it per se, but I had civilians to neutralize. Being a good security guard is all about knowing your priorities. That all changed when something violently rattled my car. While I don't have a gun, I do keep nunchucks on me at all times. I'm a blue belt in kung fu, thank you very much. So I grab those and my Nebo O2 beam, flashlight and jumped out of the car. I couldn't imagine what was responsible for the disturbance, but I assume my field supervisor had nothing to do with it. 
He didn't have much of a sense of humor, but he made it to a point to try and sneak up on unaware guards. He wasn't very good at it. It's weird though. I exit my car and there's no one in sight. There's a thin layer of snow on the ground, so footprints or tire tracks would have been there as an obvious giveaway. I was about to write it off as a weird environmental effect, but then it happened again. It didn't feel like a shaking thing when I was on my feet, though. More like a high-altitude current in the ground. Now I'm on high alert, so I switch to the emergency scanner app on my phone to see if they're getting any calls about an earthquake or explosion or something. There's no communication at all for a good five minutes. Then, some run-of-the-mill chatter about a drunk driver on the other side of town. I'm a little spooked now, but rather than get back in the car, I decided to do my next patrol a little bit earlier. I knew there wasn't nothing to worry about, but figured it would put my mind at ease to check the site for myself, just in case. I started by booking around the parking structure. There was only one accessible entrance, which my car was parked in front of, but squatters are a thing and it was a cold night. Nothing. I still had one earbud in, on the off chance that people started calling in. There's a domestic disturbance call, then silent. Then the rumbling comes back. The whole structure feels like it's wobbling. I just checked the last corner and decided to get the fuck out in case something decided to collapse. Just as I was about to leave the garage, something in my periphery catches my attention. On top of the buildings, there was a couple security lights, but one is completely obscured by a lift and construction materials. So when I tell you I saw the silhouette of a man on top of the building, understand that it's really just a silhouette. My paranoia is pretty peaked at this point, which I factored into my assessment of the situation while taking no comfort from it whatsoever. I decided to grab my binoculars out of the car which I felt confident would reveal the silhouette to be nothing more than heightened pareidolia and a stack of two-by-fours. When I got back to the car, I just about lost my shit. There was an impression in the snow, like somebody had laid across my hood. Two handprints were melted into the windshield. No footprints or tire tracks, except for the ones I knew without question I had made. I pulled out my smartphone, not really sure what I hoped to do with that, but you understand the impulse. It was off, battery dead. Before I got out of the car, the phone had been plugged in and was charging, over 90% battery. I felt the rumble again, promptly got in the car, after checking the back seat, obviously and drove it to the other side of the site. If there were squatters there, I concede the victory. Either way, I never got any complaints from the foreman or my supervisors. I asked one of the other guards if he'd seen anything weird while working the post and he just shrugged. I still have no idea what the hell happened that night. Not sure if you guys would want to hear an Asian story, but I thought it's worth sharing. This was told by my dad when I was 12. Even now, when I ask him about the story, he can remember every vivid detail, just like it happened last week. My dad was in the police force for 20 years, and when he was just a rookie, he had to conduct nighttime roadblocks, meant to catch drunk drivers. They had done it many times before, and this night started routine enough for them. That was until this Toyota Corolla drove up to them with what looked like a white blanket on its roof flapping in the wind. 
They thought it was weird, but did not see anything amiss about it. One of them even joked that this guy was multitasking by drying his laundry and driving home at the same time. The laughs stopped when the lone car came closer and all of them saw what looked like a woman in white laying face down on top of the car. The woman seemed to slide like a slug backwards until she disappeared behind the car as it eventually came to a stop in front of them. It took a few minutes for my dad's team to recompose themselves as they stared at each other as if to say, you guys saw that too, right? The most senior of them finally stepped up and shot the usual questions to the driver. There was a noticeable quiver in his voice as he made conversation and asked him to step out of the vehicle. My dad's team inspected the entire vehicle, including the boot, and found nothing strange in it. The driver was a good-looking staff sergeant in the Army who was heading home from a company event earlier that night and admitted to have had a few cans of beer. He said he laid down on his bunk to sleep it off, hence why he was driving home at night. It was technically at 4 a.m. He passed their sobriety test and they started to ask him if he saw anything weird during his drive. Initially, he said no, but after more questioning, he mentioned that he had to swerve to avoid what looked like a bird that was flying upside down. It was spooky, but he didn't think it was that big of a deal to share with the officers. The senior that told the guy to chill out at a 24-hour coffee shop before heading home, the locals believe that if a malevolent spirit follows you, make a pit stop because it confuses them so they can't set up shop in your house. After some confusion of his own, the driver finally caught on and nodded in agreement. After the guy leaves, they call it into the station and cut the night short. Never knew what happened to the driver. I really do hope he's all right. Police officer working the desk, 1500 to 2300, fire alarm signal goes off. Many, many years ago, the police department offered alarm monitoring service. Still had 10 to 12 places that were hardwired and it would require pulling apart a lot of equipment to disconnect the system, so we just kept it going. First shift dispatch is already punched in, so she took it. I'm headed out the door to the fire department when 911 rings from the same address. I answer it. No one on the other end. Assume they barely got to call from passing out. I bolt out the back door, hop in a squad car, radio in the 911 call on channel 3 that both police and fire can hear and that I'm going directly to the house. I arrive just as another unit shows up. No signs of smoke. No sign of anything. Older woman comes walking up the street pushing a wheelchair with an elderly lady, her mother. They live there and just went out for an early evening stroll before dinner. I tell them what we have going on. Nobody else lives there. And as far as the elderly lady can remember, the alarm was disconnected from the house years ago during some renovations. They don't have any alarm systems either, just a couple of smoke and fire detectors. We do a walk around the house, get to the back door off the kitchen, and you can clearly see and smell gas. We turned off the gas at the main, set up some fans to air it out, and find a cracked gas line going to the oven. The daughter said she'd spilled some coffee she was making for their walk and had to move the oven. A few inches to clean probably broke the line pushing the oven back in. Nothing else in the house is disturbed and both phones are on the hook. Fire chief shows up about 15 minutes into the call. 
He goes over to the two ladies and gives them both a hug. He's nearly in tears. The elderly lady in the wheelchair, her husband, was the fire chief 60 plus years ago for our department. The daughter, her husband passed away a few years ago. He was also a member of our department. Never believed in ghosts or spirits, but that call made me think maybe people who spend their lives doing good are allowed by some power to look over their loved ones every so often. This happened about a year ago. I had just learned while in training with my pod mates what to do if someone who had found a hanging patient was calling in. We were not allowed to say how to cut them down, just to cut them down. Then we would begin CPR until the units arrived. Well, as usual, when a lesson is talked about, life has a way of throwing those same situations on me. I was just fresh out of training, had just qualified not even a week before when I got the call. A lady had walked in to see her best friend hanging in his apartment. She called 911 screaming because I was on the fire and medical side of the house. If someone is screaming, we send them straight over to PD. Scene safety and all that. But I got her to listen to me to take a deep breath and tell me what was going on as I was getting her over to PD. I told her to cut him down. I didn't care how, just to do it now. Okay, she cried as she cut him down, and I heard a loud thump when he hit the ground. This woman, who was still sobbing, came back to the phone. We were already on the way. She had already given us the location. Even though she was crying, even though she already knew he was dead, together we started CPR. She knew her best friend was gone, but she did everything in her power in hopes that he would wake up. She had to go outside to wait for the medics and PD to arrive because she knew he was gone and it broke her heart to see him like this. Guys, she saved my life too. Those wells as she did chest compressions, her cries as she tried to contemplate what her friend had done to herself, asking him how she would live without him. I used to have suicidal ideations. Used to. Yes, I am in therapy and so on, and yes, it has done so much to save my own life. But... That courageous woman and her desperation to keep her best friend alive. I know what pure heartbreak sounds like in another human being's voice, thanks to her. All I wanted to do was be there with her, being that shoulder she could cry on. Why would I ever do that to my husband? She may have thought she had failed to save her friend that day. If she only knew, she had saved me. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true 911 and police stories. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Tammy Slayton, Mrs. Innerscare, Chrissy Elias, Sugar Spite, Tina Mead, Cindy, Amy Glimco, Anita B, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Colt Stonewolf, Luz Crispin, Samantha Place, Patty's Niece, Denise S, Kwame Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all so much for your continued support of Back to Ashes. If it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be me and there would be no channel. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this selection. In the meantime, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.